All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to first, first session of day two of Google I.O. Hope everyone had a great day yesterday. Uh, we're going we're gonna to spend most of our time answering your questions. There are two microphones in the aisle, and uh, you know, if there's anyone, as there are people queued up at the microphones, you guys get precedence over just about anything that, that we would want to say. But we're here to, to chat with you. Uh, you know, we're sitting down, and we don't have slides because this is meant to be a conversation. Uh, I want to start off with a, a little bit of introductions both ways. So I'm going to ask the folks who are up, sitting up here with me to give you a little bit of information about who they are and what their areas are and the kinds of questions they're uh, best able and best, best capable to, to answer from you all. Uh, I'm going to ask you as an audience a couple of questions, show hands kind of things, just to get a sense of who's who here. Uh, and, but, but at any point, feel free to step up to the mics and, and we'll jump in once we get through that. So uh, I'll start. I'm David Glazer. I'm the Director of Engineering for the Google Plus platform. We're the team that's responsible for connecting what people do on Google and in Google Plus with what they do everywhere else on all the apps, all the sites that they visit. Uh, and we can go deeper into any part of that as you want later on. I've been at Google for about seven years now, so I've, I've worked on different projects and different teams at Google, and uh, this, is, this is one of the fun ones. So why, why don't we start at that end? Uh, Jen, you want to? Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lin. Uh, I'm an Eng manager on the Google Plus platform team. I specifically work on building Android and iOS libraries for uh, you guys, and uh, so you could connect users to Google Plus sign in. And I also work on uh, offering you guys REST APIs. I've been at Google for uh, six years, and this is the second team I've been on. Hey everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Vic Frizel. I lead developer relations for Google Plus and Google Apps. I've worked at Google for almost four years now. Um, my team is generally responsible for delivering a good developer experience um, from end to end. So when you first decide to adopt Google Plus and integrate, uh, all the way up to launching your application in production and then maintaining it over time. Uh, so we're responsible for things like the documentation and the samples. Uh, we work with a lot of you in a one-on-one -on -one capacity uh, in which your integration requires some special attention. Um, but really, we're focused on making your integration as simple as possible. Hi, I'm Chi. Um, I manage the engineering team for Hangouts. So um, I guess prior to yesterday, people uh, understood that to be the uh, video chatting uh, sort of system. And now we've expanded that to include the, the new app that includes uh, text messaging um, and um, media all the way up through uh, video. Hi, I'm Sandy Jen. Um, I came to Google less than a year ago through the Amiibo acquisition as one of the co-founders with Seth here. Um, I am an engine manager on the uh, publisher side, so all the publisher offerings to help gain audience and eyeballs to your apps and sites, um, my team kind of takes control of. Hi there, I'm Seth. So like Sandy said, also joined just under a year ago with Amoeba Acquisitions. So I'm David's counterpart. I run product for uh, the Google Plus platform. Um, just one quick second on the Google Plus platform for those who missed it yesterday. Uh, like David said, the goal is to make it really easy for users to bring the best of their Google experience with them to the rest of the internet. So you know, when they're on a given site, like a couple of days ago we launched with Forbes, they can see recommended content as they're scrolling through articles in Forbes and see really interesting other articles that they might want to see. Or you know, because we know they have an Android phone, if they connect with a website of yours and they say, hey, I want to go ahead and sign in with Google Plus Sign In, then we say, would you like the Android app too, right? So great for the users for app discovery, great for all of you because it drives more Android installs where you tend to have more engaged traffic. So the goal for users is the rest of, you know, bring Google with them to the rest of the internet and then the best of their internet experience back to Google. We'll talk about specifics uh, later on in this session. Um, at the same time for you guys, all of the product that we're putting out should drive you either more unique users more engaged users, right, which means more page views, or create a completely seamless experience between mobile and desktop. We should make it so that you form a relationship with your user and your service, not your user and your service and a device, which is just too complicated. So uh, I'm sure we'll get to talk more about that too. I'm okay with the mic. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, uh, so that's us. Let me, ask, let, let me get to know you guys a little bit better. Um, in, in no particular order, I'm trying to get a sense of how much you have already or are interested in using different parts or different features of our platform. So let me start with how, how many of you manage a Google Plus page? 
Okay, that's a large fraction of the audience. That's interesting. How, how, many, of you, um, how many of you have written non-trivial code in the last year? Okay, how, how about in the last decade? My hand goes up in the last decade, but not in the last year. Okay. Um, of, of, the, of the people who've written code, how many of you have written, have written web code, whether it's back end, front end, something that's backing a web page? Okay. How about Android code? Uh, iOS code? Okay. That's a you know, good mix of all of the above. I happened to ask them in the order. Hands went, got a little bit smaller for each of those questions, but a good mix of all of the above. <laughs> Um, how many of you have put a Google Plus widget on a website? Probably a plus one button, because it's the one that's been out the longest. All right. How many of you have integrated Google Plus sign-in into something? All right. We've got about a 10, 20, somewhere between 10 and 20 hands that went up for that one. How many of you, okay, so now I'm going to look forward. How many of you think that over the next year you will be integrating Google Plus sign-in into something you're doing? About three times as many hands as before. All right, that's, that's useful. Um, hangouts, how many, of you have, uh, how many of you have been in a Hangout in the last week? Okay. How many of you have used an app in a Hangout? How many of you have used an app other than a mustache in a Hangout? <laughs> okay. how, how many of you have built a Hangout app? Okay, that's, a, that's a, you know, about seven or so, like there. All right, that, that's great. That, that's useful. That, that actually, I'm very happy to see that mix of things because there's a, there's a, you know, I'm seeing a fair amount of interest in all of the different things that, that, you know, that we all can, can help answer questions on. Uh, I invite you guys up to the mic. I, uh, I, you know, I'll ask questions if you don't, but mine are going to be softballs. Right? You, you, you know, if you want the, the, the hard questions, you need to ask them. So, so come on up. Uh, oh, great. Yeah. something unknown, then it was clear it's not a blogging service, something more, it moved in public cognition to something more like Pinterest or something like that. How do you want to see Google Plus's identity in, in the eyes of your users in the long term? What's the, if not a rival point, but a reasonable milestone in terms of what it is, how you define it? Google. Yes, that, that's, that's a good question. I'll take a, I'll take a first crack at it, but anyone else who wants to jump in. I think the way to understand Google Plus from Google's point of view is there happens to be a product at plus.google.com and on the mobile apps. It's a great product. It's a very important product. And it's not the main point. What Google Plus really is, is it's a way for Google to get to know our users. Right? It's a way for Google to have a relationship with people where we know something about who our users are. We know something about who they're in relationships with, who, that, who else they care about. And we, know, and we give them a way to share with other users and with people that they know or people they might want to know. And that, that layer, that spine, that backbone, really is designed to make all of Google better. Can search be better if we knew who you were? Could maps be better if we knew who you were? Well, if you saw the keynote yesterday, you know the answer to both of those is yes, right? Could, could YouTube be better if we know who you are? Could Docs be better if we know who you are? Could Gmail be better if we knew more about the ways you connect with other people? It all, we already obviously know who you are. Th that's the real point of Google+, is to, to allow that, that, that notion of who, pe who people are as people to be available across all of Google, and then with this team, to also be available for everything else that you do online. Within that, all of the hypotheses you tossed out, the answer is yes, right? Is it useful for a blogging service to know who people are? Of course. Is it useful for a content discovery and curation system to know who people are and who they're connected to? Yes. Is it useful for a conversation system to know who people are and, and what they care about? Yes. So all of those end up being important features of who are you. So Any, anyone? Let me, uh, let me make, give you a couple examples to, to bring some of those points home because I think it's pretty important. So uh, if you think about Hangouts and you know, what we were talking about with Hangouts and uh, Qi and team built just very recently, um, Hangouts, if you think about it, are woven. It's a social piece of Google, right? That's woven into Gmail. It's woven into plus.google.com. You'll, you'll see that across properties, right, to make it really easy for users to communicate with each other live across various Google properties. 
if you think about uh, what's happened with Google Plus sign-in and how an application can write app activities that a user's taking. So for example, tune in, writing to Google, hey, here are the music stations that our users are listening to in TuneIn. And then we take those and we aggregate them anonymously and we put them into search. So when someone does a search for TuneIn, they can see what actual people are doing inside that app at search and have more context before they ever go there. And then when they click on you know, that radio station that interests them, because they can see what's hot in TuneIn right now, they're a very qualified user that's heading over to that particular property, in that case, TuneIn. Or when someone sends an interactive post, right? So this is based on, obviously, we know who you are inside a given application, like at OpenTable. We know you want to send something to a friend of yours. And if you write your friend's name, then that post goes through all Google properties, right? Because it hits the notifier, which appears in search and in YouTube. And it goes on the stream inside Google+. It's so like David said, all of the features, if you really kind of break it down, right, they're about connecting a user seamlessly across all Google properties with who they are and who their friends are. I'm sorry, just maybe to follow up. My question uh, is not how Google sees the Google Plus, but how you want the users to see it. And so far, I, I don't hear anything like specific, so I take my takeaway then, and I just want to check if it's right, that Google doesn't want user per se to see Google Plus. They no, want no. to see what's on the top of it. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair? question. I, I, I think the, the way I think about this is we want users to see Google Plus as a real reflection yep. of the life. We designed circles to better enable you to really reflect that your connections to people, to friends and family, coworkers, are at different levels. Your interactions with them are at different levels. We designed Hangouts to bring you face-to-face -face so that interactions are real. We want to facilitate very real interactions that you have with your friends, your family, your neighbors, your acquaintances, other people around the world, with, in, in a real way, but bring that to the, the web and, and to the internet and make uh, bringing the people around the world closer by using our technology, but it still is making it as real as possible. I think that's how we want people to perceive uh, Google+. Does that answer your question? It's, yes. Yeah, so I, I take it as essentially it's an embodiment of the connections which users have in real yes. life. Yep. And making that richer, facilitating to the uh, yep. information world. To yeah, that's exactly right. And okay. because there's many kinds of connections, there's many ways to use. All right, let's go to the back microphone. Sure. Um, I don't so think, yeah. It's, okay, so I had a question on uh, Google Apps for uh, business. Yep. Um, how do you want uh, <clears throat> um, Google Plus to be viewed for Google Plus for business? If Google Apps for Business. So do you think that Google Plus is evolving into some kind of a Yammer for uh, businesses? Or um, is it evolving into um, just uh, contact discovery and intranet page for uh, businesses? What's the direction? What's the vision and mission? So um, Vic, do you want to take this one? So I'm sorry, was the question how we're targeting Google Apps for Business integrated with Google Plus? Correct. Uh, so Google Plus is, being ava is made available for Google Apps for Businesses, right? Yes. How, how does Google Apps, uh, how do businesses use Google Plus better? Is the Google Plus uh, uh, platform being developed in the direction of being a Yammer? Or is it being developed in the direction of being uh, just an intranet page where people can share and it's a kind of a social discovery kind of a thing, but not really a Yammer? Maybe we should talk a little bit about how we use it internally as one data point as well yeah. as what we're seeing. So in, internally within Google, uh, we obviously have our own Google Apps domain, google.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that we're maybe the biggest user of Google Apps. <laughs> uh, yesterday I received 2,000 emails. And what I would say is that Google Plus coming into Google Apps for Business um, in a more prolific way is actually having a, a pretty large impact. So internally, what we do with Google Plus and these social annotations uh, throughout the rest of Google are really fueled by uh, my connections internally at work. So I work for a company with like 50,000 people, and I know maybe 1,000 of those people. Uh, that's actually... And they all sent you email yesterday. They all sent me an email, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, 
so when I interact with these people, there's, there's different ways in which I need to interact with them. So for instance, uh, I said when I started, I work on Google Apps and on Google Plus. So I have circles internally for the Google Plus folks and then also for the Google Apps folks. And one integration for me that's really useful is the integration between circles and Gmail, for instance. So now I can much more easily categorize and, and find the emails that are relevant to Google Plus, things I'm working on on Google Plus, and things I'm working on on Google Apps. And that's an example of a social annotation and a social integration between our services that could not exist without Google Plus uh, being there for Google Apps for Business. So that's a really, really compelling feature. And we have a number of these other features. Hangouts internally is one of our most prolific services. Um, I think we, we use Hangouts every day. Every G meeting G I have. G G do you know how many hours of? No, we do about 20,000 Hangouts a day um, internally. So it's, uh, we, we really work by, by it. But also we connect that through to the rest of uh, Google Plus internally. And we share information out. And when people have issues or questions they don't quite know who to go to, often what they'll do is they'll use Google Plus internally. And then people will comment, respond to it, or forward it around and find the right people. So it's, 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 I think it's a, a great tool to communicate and bring, uh, bring people closer together, whether it's outside uh, in your uh, personal life or within a business set setting. Sure. There, was a, there was a session yesterday. It was end of day yesterday. The video w was not up as of first thing this morning, but it will be up shortly on how to get the most out of Google Plus in your domain and organization. Um, that had some interesting discussion about this. We we're just starting to offer some platform capabilities so you can program on top of that and do some, some uh, making it fit better in your org. But uh, as with the first question, I think my short answer to your question is all of the above, right? Google Plus works to add that layer of who are my coworkers to all of my interactions at work. Sure. So then um, uh, from a business perspective, there is a conflict between Google Plus for personal account and Google Plus for uh, business account. How do you really allow multi-login over the Android, or is that some, something in the development direction that's happening, wherein you could have a personal Gmail as well as a business Gmail coexisting on a mobile device, wherein you can switch and toggle back and forth? Uh, yeah, so we, we, everyone who works at Google lives in that world of having at least two accounts. I bet the average number, of, the average Googler has 2.2 accounts, is my guess, you know, with a few people having you know, multiple from side things. And I think my take on it is living in that world is not bad today. Pretty much everything I want to do with having the two identities works, but it's not great today either. And we are, and it gets, it's getting better. We keep, we keep across, you know, there's Chrome capabilities and there are app capabilities. The, the multi-login, the ad account thing works. Browser profiles is sometimes helpful. Uh, you know, on my phone, I can easily switch between my two, my two email accounts and it's comfortable. So uh, I, I think th that, that category of people who have two accounts is going to always be a minority and always be a very large and important minority and it's slowly getting better. Okay. Thanks. All right, front mic, please. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Mooney Lange, and I uh, come from a company called The Audience out in Beverly Hills. Um, and we manage uh, brands, we manage celebrities, uh, social media presence. So can you, can you n drop a name or two? Come on, you work at The you Audience. You want me to? Yeah, give us a name or two. Um, I don't know, I heard some guy that performed last night with one of our clients. Okay. So, <laughs> the, the younger one. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> Not necessarily the better shape one, the younger one. <laughs> um, the, we have an interesting um, model in, in that, in this like kind of celebrity and agency type world, we have to represent a persona, not necessarily a person. So these direct connections are, we want people to connect with a person's image, but not necessarily, maybe not them them themselves. Like I, I doubt that. Um, Steve Aoki would want you to know exactly what he's eating right now, you know, but he would want you to know where he's performing or where he's, uh, when a new album is coming out. So the way that we, I, I see that there's all these hooks in with, with sign on and with app and everything, but we have to establish uh, a need to put these people and their personas on every social media uh, platform out there. And it, for us, the difficulty has been um, I see the value in all these other aspects, but why would I want to get a celebrity or a brand on Google Plus without, and I, I think one thing is I, I would need to get some type of value metrics 
to prove the benefits of being on Google Plus for these brands and these celebrities because it's hard to pitch to them. And so is there anything being done to address that? Uh, and even though I know it's, it's been talked about like all this in, uh, integration, what about the feed? What about, is there value in getting these people on the feed? Is there gonna be any, need, is there gonna be any effort to really get more people to interact uh, with the feed? Or is it just a place to, you gotta get content on there so that it'll be relevant for search. I, I, so that I know how to position this to our business and to our clients. Um, you, you wanna take it, sure. Seth? Yeah. So, um, I think there are, there are a few answers to that. It's a really great question. Uh, the first is just focusing on plus.google.com itself, right? So the social destination. Um, I think there are a lot of ways for you know, celebrities, for personas as you say it, that you can really get a community engaged and involved around that person. Uh, one obviously is if you have a page for them, right? Another one is if you choose to have a profile for them. Uh, you know, we've kind of seen it go uh, both ways, and um, in both cases, it's a great way to have their kind of audience engage with them, at least as they're, you know, putting out posts, right? One of the advantages, if they have a page that's very active, uh, given that they're a persona, is that a, no a, a lot of that content can make its way into Google search. So if someone went and searched for, you know, the celebrity's name, Right? There's a social card that will come up on the right-hand side where the ads usually are, right. but instead it'll have recent posts from the page. And I, I understand that. So what I need to be able to do is, how can I quantify that success in a nice report to some Hollywood executive that is breathing down my neck? To sh I can tell them, hey, you're showing up in search. Like, no, show me some numbers. That's, that's kind of where I, I am in terms of I need some type of quantifiable metrics and reporting. I hear that you have this amazing product called Google Analytics that would be great for this, so I'm just wondering if there will be even plans to integrate with that. I, I think that's good feedback that we should take back. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's an important point that you raise that in order for you to help your customers, there's more information that you guys uh, you need. I also think that another thing to, to think about it is that we're trying to open up new experiences that you may not be able to do in any other platform. So. Uh, we have a lot of entertainers who launch their albums on Hangouts, so Alicia Keys and Taylor Swift and that sort of thing. And, and, and people can connect with their fan base in a richer, new way that they couldn't have before. I mean, this morning, the Star Trek crew had a Hangout, I mean, which is kind of a brand new, innovative experience. And they, the feedback that we're getting is that that connection is unique and rich and it just takes it to a new level. So, to I think a, we could, should take you the could feedback. maybe even say to a new frontier. <laughs> um, you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get too many groans if I say that. But I, I, I think that we should take your point that like you're asking for more clarity, more metrics to help you, and and, and I think that we could we yep. would also say there's value in new experiences that we would. Yeah, all I'm saying is if I'm going to tell JJ Abrams pay me a million bucks to have a hangout, that he's going to tell me all right, prove to me what value it gives me. Aside from, it sounds really cool. Yeah, that's yeah. All. I, and, I think that's a fair point. And do yeah. know that in the, uh, so this is something that we have heard, the first places that you can see some metrics coming through on social engagement is actually if you do use Google Plus sign-in, there's a dashboard that's available at your Plus page where you can see uh, engagement metrics, how many people are signing in, how many people are sending interactive posts. It's a start. The click rate, it's a start, like David said, but you will see us continue to improve there because we do know it's an area of, um, kind of desire for people. Thank you. All right, back microphone, please. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, kind of a design suggestion for you. So, so one of the pain points I have in having a multi-account sign into the, the plus uh, site, plus.google.com, um, this typically happens when I'm landing on a community page or, or a profile page of some user and I've gotten there because I've clicked in a link in Gmail or some, some other thing, and I'm in the wrong account, that I want to circle that person in one of my other accounts, not that one. Um, the way you do it now, when you switch accounts, you just open up a new page, and I'm in the home page of my Google+, I've lost the context of that person, and even if I copy and paste a URL because of the little slash u slash n thing, 
I'm, I'm, I'm hopelessly lost uh, about how to even get that circle, that per, that, back to that page uh, in the right account. So I would just suggest that when you switch accounts, in those cases where you're on a community page or a profile page, you stay there instead of taking me to my home page. That's, that's, a, that's great a great suggestion. suggestion. I had that problem this morning. How, how, many, people, <laughs> how, how many people here have been burned by that in the last week? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Okay, front microphone. Um, it's just a quick question. Is I've been in process of moving a bunch of blogs and stuff into basically a community because it has a lot more traction and a lot more visibility. Yep. The problem is your uh, text formatting kind of is lacking. Like you can't actually bold, italicize. You can't insert images into feeds. You can't do a lot of the basic stuff that you can do with Blogger and some of the other tools. So. If that's one of the purposes to generate more social interaction, more of a conversation with people, it'd be great if we actually had the basic font manipulation tools that most of your other products seem to have. Or I could have missed it. It's just I've been trying to get onto the internet in this room, and it's a little bit hard. Yeah. The, the, there, there are some very basic markdown that you probably do know about where you can bold and italicize right. text. And that far from addresses everything about your question, but right. it's, it's a, it is something. Right. Uh, I, I've heard that before. There's a balance that we are you know, looking for where we don't want to, uh, we, we don't want to make, first of all, we don't want to make it too hard, and second of all, we don't want to make it too noisy for people who are, you know, like the, the, the birth of desktop publishing where everyone showed off, they knew how to pick fonts, was right. not, yeah. Um, but I also agree with you that there's a kind of communication, so it's a, it's a good point. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Back, Mike. Hi. First, uh, I want to make a, a comment. Um, Google Plus as a, as a platform for us, and I come from a large enterprise, has been phenomenal. It has absolutely changed the way we can do work. The, the real-time collaboration, we've never seen it before. Um, we have played around with looking at you know, what Microsoft has in the past, and I have to tell you, that, that really never came to fruition for us. It really didn't meet what we needed. But Google Plus uh, is one of those you know, sets of tools where we did uh, Google Apps, and then along comes Google Plus as this small little thing you think of for Hangouts, but what a great, great tool for us to be able to collaborate and have people bring themselves together for the things that they need to do. Adding in things like you know, collaborating on documents, on files, that are, are share, you know, doing screen sharing and things like that. It's absolutely just turned around the way we can do business. And so I just want to congratulate you guys for a really great uh, Thank great you, G. Tool set. I did not pay him. <laughs> no, you don't have to pay him. Well, you I swear, pay him. I had never met him before. Uh, but now I want to ask you that separate question, though. So I think it's for, I don't know your name on the end, but you talk about iOS and, and Android. So in looking at the tools that you have right now, you've got, it, it's kind of a mishmash right now. You've got this great Google Plus app that's got built-in applications today, and now you just released Hangouts that has Hangouts and messaging, but you've got Hangouts and messaging within the Google Plus app. So is there a plan to deprecate uh, Google Plus uh, features and functions and build out separate applications for those? Or what's the, what's the, like, the long-term strategy and the vision on that to try to help our, you know, explain this to our users properly so they know we can tell them just how to do it one way and not how to do it multiple different ways? So let, let me see if I got your question and correct me before I answer the wrong question. So the question is really around since we brought Hangouts top level, um, is this a, a, a strategy where we will bring lots and lots of features as independent apps? Is that your question? At, at the same time, will you then be deprecating them out of the Google Plus apps? Ah, okay. Um, so uh, we, we won't be bringing all, all independent functionality and, and breaking apart the Google Plus app into a whole bunch of different um, apps. Uh, but we believe that for this particular case, it was important because this is a use pattern that people have with, uh, with many other tools that we provided, um, like Google Plus Messenger and Talk um, and, and Google Voice. And since they're used to going at, at it and getting access to it in this way, where it's top level, we want to do a better job of having a uh, comprehensive tool that still matches that use pattern. So I don't think that you should look at this as a strategy for all of Google Plus features, but I think this is a very, very unique case. Um, 
So that's, I think that's half, the, half your question. Right. The other half is, will we be removing and deprecating that functionality out of the Google Plus app? Right. Um, yes. So we will be investing and continue to invest heavily in the Hangouts app and the functionality there, and we'll reconcile that with the Google Plus app in the very near future. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, Ron. Hi. Um, the question is about Google Events, which is a great feature and you know very useful. We are I'm part of the GDG Dublin organizer group, so we're using that you know to have our events and have all the photos and the comments from the people who came. But there's one feature really missing: is all events are public events, so open to everyone. But we have a limit for the room we have, like 80, 100 people, and there's no way to say well. We have a limit of you know, 80 and then system of waiting list, so that would be a great feature to have. And then the other question again about events. Once an event is finished, it's like I guess it's a future, uh, uh, something that maybe you could ha bring in the future is have some sort of statistics or data of, about your events. Like how many people came and you know, how many people say they would came but never checked in, you know, not per people coming, but like a more general kind of statistics, you know, on, on the event. Those are two great requests. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I have nothing to announce right now about any immediate plans, but those are good ideas. Okay. All right. Anyone else? No? Yeah. Okay. All right. In the back. Hi, a quick comment first. Um, I meet with a couple different folks in Hangouts each week in some different industries, and uh, I just wanted to mention that we had one last week, people all over the country, about five or six participants. One of the ladies that was pretty necessary for the meeting was not joining, so I called and said, hey, you joining us soon? I'm stuck in traffic, it'll be about 15 minutes. Instead of wasting everybody's time or trying to reschedule, I remembered hearing that you guys integrated some phone with it, we called her, it worked flawlessly. She could hear everybody, we could hear her real well, it was great. Um, question Gee, for how you. much of a marketing budget did you have? <laughs> uh, I only have $20. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I travel around uh, and I check out Plus, I like to look at what's hot and then occasionally I look at nearby just to kind of get a flavor for what's happening in the city. And about two weeks ago I was in Charlotte and I went to what's nearby or whatever you, whatever you title it. And literally spent two or three minutes scrolling through and saw the same guys either Spotify songs or something that he's listening to. Just hundreds and hundreds, like every three minutes, here's what he's listening to. Here's, and it, it basically drowned everybody else out. And my question is, is that a user error? Is that a developer error? Did he flip a bunch of switches to just say, make everything I do public? Is that how it comes standard? And just saying it was, you know, it really kind of flooded everybody else out. First of all, it's always our problem if you had a bad experience. Right. So, you know, none, none, none of the, there may be other things, but it's always yeah. our problem. But go yeah. ahead, sir. But um, so actually, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how that happened. That was probably the user just literally choosing to post everything kind of manually into the stream. Okay. Because um, there is not a way for developers to be able to kind of write programmatic activity like that and have it all get into the stream. Right. Like a design point uh, when we did app activities, so when we let developers start writing activities into Google's, we really want to take that and put it into places that have real meaning and context for users. So if you had gone to that person's profile and you were specifically looking for what they had done in a given app, yeah. then you would see the full stream of what they've done in that app. But we are specifically not just publishing it to stream because you know, at this point in time, like right, you know, a stream is chronological, right, more or less. Mm -hmm. And you might not really care right now that I read an article or listened to a song, but if you start searching for music, great music mm -hmm. later, you might really care. Right? or looking yep. for you know, travel destinations. You might really care what I've read about great travel destinations. So um, that, like David said, that's probably our fault that it was able to happen, but um, it's definitely design, a design point. What we heard from users was, it was actually interesting. They said, I want to absolutely know that I'm not going to spam my friends. Yes. But when I want to share to my friends, I want to know they're going to get it. And that was hard for us to reconcile initially, right? We did a lot of thinking about that, and that's why we landed on kind of programmatic app activities written to Google do not just publish, publish to stream, but if a user chooses to share something and they write in a friend's name, then we're gonna you know, pop a notification to that user on every Google property, yep. Yep. right, to make certain that that user's friends do get that message. Um, so yeah, our fault, but uh, not a design point. All right, cool, thanks. In front, please. Hi, my name is... 
Hi, my name is Diana. I'm, I'm a user experience designer with Bridgepoint Education, and I wanted to say it's really exciting what you guys are doing with a social platform and changing the landscape of learning. And I wanted to ask from your experience, or if you could give insight from an institution level, from a student level, and from a professor level, where have you seen the biggest pain points being alleviated by utilizing Google Plus, and or where have you seen the most value being out added in the learning or teaching experience? So um, I don't know if you did you get a chance to attend the Coursera. Um, I did. I did. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was a really short course, and they didn't get to dive too much into it. So I was hoping to see um, if okay. you guys could add anything to that. Yeah, so the, the observation that we had when we looked at, uh, if you guys aren't familiar, the Coursera is online learning, so um, uh, it's, it's a MOOC. And one of the things that we've noticed is that there's a large fall off on people who start the course versus then who complete the course. Um, and we know through uh, education, and, um, and you just think about your, uh, your experiences, maybe in college or whatever, a huge part of your memories and what keeps you going is actually the interactions that you have with others, whether it be other students or direct connections with you have with the TAs. And we also find this is true with MOOCs. When people connect with other people, then they stay with the program longer. When they're alone and studying alone and sometimes getting frustrated alone, then they fall off. So um, what we found through uh, this, the, uh, the work that we've done with, uh, with partners is that when we're actually able to bring people face to face, I think that's been a huge help. Now, as we've learned that there are a bunch of, uh, of uh, challenges in bringing people face to face around the world in this online sort of world, some of that is timing, coordination, and time zones, uh, and, and that sort of stuff, and finding compatibility in language. And those are the sort of things that we're tr really trying to work through. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And then from an institution level, I mean, I don't know if you've worked with any brick and mortar schools, but if you can share any experiences where on a university actual location level. Um, yeah, so, um, so we've worked with uh, several universities on this. Um, there are, uh, actually, we, we found that there are a lot of universities who are, are just trying things, and then we're finding out about them afterwards, which is amazing. Um, the MIT Media Lab, uh, for example, has been doing a bunch of online courses uh, using, using Hangouts. Um, and I think part of the challenge there is that they want to reach a very large audience, hundreds if not thousands of people. Um, so they're using uh, on-air and broadcasting. Okay. And two of, the, uh, two of the most common requests we get there are for, for some, some universities who want to restrict that to just a limited audience. Uh, uh, MIT is, is a bit more willing to have the world see it. But the other one is, okay, when you have a large audience, how do you manage Q&A with 1,000 people? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the, one of the challenges that, that, that we're thinking through, but also that um, we find that partners are able to come up with other solutions as well to complement ours. So it turns out um, my mother's a teacher. <laughs> Um, and I was talking to her a little bit about how she could use, she asked me, she's like, hey, you work at you know, Google Plus, how, how can I use this in, with my students? Um, one thing we also talked about was the idea of creating a community for her class, and you can create closed communities. And so that's a really good way to just let your, you as a teacher and all the students in your class interact with each other. Um, so that's something you might look at. The other thing I was pointing my mother to is, hey, you can actually create a circle for everybody in your class, and that's a really easy way to share things that you find that are really interesting for all of your students. Uh, so those are another couple things that, you know, in, in real life when my mother said, hey, what do I do, <laughs> I pointed out to her. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm back. Hi. Um, how are you? A couple of uh, issues. I'm a startup um, addict. Um, so currently I have five active Google App accounts in different domains, plus my personal Gmail account. And one of the issues that I have is that, um, well, I had to create the, the Google Plus profile for each account to administer the pages for each company and stuff like that. Um, but the issue that I have is that I get people following me in Google Plus accounts where I don't post. So the issues that I, that, that I have with Google Plus is that I can't consolidate my profiles or automatically redirect, or when they follow me on, 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 one, on one company, say, hey, you know, this is not an active Google Plus. Um, please follow me on my Gmail account. 
you know, which is something that I actually I post that, right? So one of the issues that I have there is that um, um, having so many Google Plus accounts sort of messes up my um, online profile. So when, when you Google me, you go, you might get uh, one of the profiles that I, I, I don't actually use, and it, it's it's hard for people to um, um, investors actually as well to actually get a hold of me um, because they try to reach me through one of the accounts that is not really active. So I have. So that's one of the quirks that I have about, about Plus, the profiles themselves. Um, also, I'm sort of a geek, so I don't really use Google Plus web profile because, you know, <laughs> I'm not that social. Um, what? But what I do use is the app APIs, and uh, I want to say thank you for the APIs that were released about uh, 11 weeks ago. Um, and I noticed that there are two subsets of APIs. There's an HTTP APIs, which is mostly REST, um, you know, to get people list, circle list, et cetera. And you have the web API to be able to do posts, uh, interactive posts, et cetera. Um, the issue there is that, well, to be honest, when I saw, when I saw the, what the, uh, the web APIs, I figured, hey, this is web, it has to be REST, I, I should be able to hack this easily and make my own REST calls. I almost got it, but it never worked. Um, but that's the thing, I mean, I would, um, for the web APIs, why aren't there HTTP equivalents? You know, why am I forced to use the, uh, the iframe or the Google interface to share a post? Why can't I do it server side? Um, to be honest, I have an extension, a Chrome extension, which allow, currently allows the person to cross post um, into Twitter and Facebook. And I'd love to add, hey, you know, cross post this to all your networks, but I can't. You know, they have to cross post to Facebook, Twitter, and then they take the additional step to post to uh, Google+. Yep. Um, let, me, let me pick apart those questions. On your first question, which is, hey, you have, you have too many profiles. You're, you're, you're not social, but you have a lot of profiles, exactly. something like that. Um, I, I don't have a magic answer to that, but there's something that I've certainly seen other people use, which is use the profile picture to encourage or discourage people paying attention to you. If you have a picture on one of them and not on the others, or uh, you know, that's a pretty strong signal that this is the real you, this is the one that you care about. And there are, you could, you, there are the simple things, if anyone has other tips, but that would work. Um, on your, your, your other question, let me make sure I heard it right and, and, and before answering. So we have a set of APIs which are RESTful APIs, which are designed for programmatic access, whatever. You, you, you're, you're, you like that set of APIs, you like that model of interaction. We have another set of interfaces which are, which are widgets, which are user present interactions with a user that let the user do some things. And you're asking how come we don't let you programmatically automate all of the capabilities that we offer via widgets. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And the, the answer to that is, is very similar to Seth's answer before. It's, uh, it's so that you don't cause problems for our, our friend who visits Charlotte by, by over automatically writing to his stream, right? The, the intent is we are trying to say there's a set, of, a set of interactions that we really want to be human-based, human-present, a user actually did this interactions. And the, the safe way for us to do that is to say the only way to do that interaction is through a Google UI. So we know for a fact that when someone posts, it's because they saw a UI, they saw it was a Google UI, they looked at their circles, they said share. And, and, and it, there are legitimate use cases where programmatic access would make sense and it was the user's explicit intent, but they're very hard to tell apart from the, the unsavory use cases. And I trust you, but I don't necessarily trust everyone else who might accidentally or intentionally misuse the kind of API that would, that would do dangerous things automatically. Yeah, but at the same time, um, sorry for saying this, but Google Plus right now is trying to, has to play catch up with the other social networks like Twitter and Facebook. All right, so if you have a tool which allows you to consolidate your um, social network access, um, but you can't consolidate the access to Google Plus, it's harder for the user to incentivate the user to, hey, you know, you also have Google Plus, try to see what advantages it has over Facebook and Twitter, for example. 
you know, you, with the tool that I'm developing, at least you can't really do that um, because there's an extra strap for, 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 uh, for, for Google+. You know, so you have this, this tool which tries to consolidate everything, but you know, there's always the exception that for Google+, you have to bring up the widget. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a quality quantity of conversation trade-off, and we are starting by being very careful to keep the quality of the conversation in Google Plus high. And it, it is a trade-off. I agree with you, there are use, there are, there's some value to a, to a different point, but we're starting by making sure that we keep the, the quality of, and of the community and the conversations as human as possible, and we are willing to take some short-term, slower quantity of information, of conversation, to have it be higher quality. The other thing to think about is that we're not trying to mimic the interactions that you'd have on other social networks. Yeah. We're trying to create a much more engaging human, like she said, sort of real life equivalent on the web. And so in some cases, you know, as David said before, we don't necessarily want you to have the exact same uh, sort of blast out you know, sequence of events that you would have on a Facebook or Twitter. So it could be right now our experiences may seem very similar, but as we've developed and made more product plans, we hope to sort of differentiate in that way so that it becomes more clear when you'd want to use Google Plus versus when you want to use Facebook versus when you want to use all three. Perfect, thank you very much. Yep. I'm told I'm too tall for IO, am I okay here? I wish I, wish I had the problem of being all too right, tall. All right, okay, yes. Uh, I'm slouch like a geek. Um, uh, love Google Plus, uh, my only complaint since people are, is the multiple account thing in terms of Having my old app, my apps account versus my Gmail account, it means that I get lesser experience throughout Google as a result. Right, my now isn't as good because Plus is here. But that's not why I want to be up here. I just want to cut that in. Quick question. I work with a lot of media companies, not like J.J. Abrams who can pay a million dollars, but poor, dying newspapers. And I'm trying to convince them how wonderful Google Plus is and how they should work with local businesses for Google Plus. So quick question. What would your ideal media organization, especially a local one, do on Google Plus? And what in turn would they ideally help uh, small local businesses do on Google Plus? That's a really good question. Um, so in terms of uh, media organization, uh, first off, if they, you know, presumably right now a lot of their traffic, probably the dominant traffic is going to their website. Um, there are great social interactions that people actually are having on that property that can probably be used to filter uh, kind of social data into Google, so something like, hey, I just read this you know, article, you might want to read it too. And if the user does you know, Google Plus sign in on that, you know, for that property, and the user sends their friend an interactive post, that will have a read button on it, right? So when it goes into the stream, it will literally have a big, like, click me to send my friend back to that media organization. Same thing for something like watching a video, right? Like, ask your friend to watch with you. Right, and send an interactive post that has a watch button on it. Or commenting, like, I want to hear what you think about this. So, you know, send an interactive post with an action to comment. So one thing we'd love to see um, publishers do, you know, both mobile and web, of course, is send interactive posts that are about engagement, about getting the, their current fans to engage their friends back at that property. A um, couple other things. Uh, a couple of things. Um, creating a plus page is an awesome way for that, um, that property to get more traffic and more engagement inside Google's ecosystem as a whole. Um, when we see people do an awesome job on plus pages, and National Geographic has done an amazing job with their plus page, Wall Street Journal has done an amazing job with their plus page, they have millions of followers, and you know, they have really high community engagement, so they've opened up a channel with their fans inside Google. Uh, and that gets them, obviously, you know, the social card inside uh, Google search, and so it's even more discoverability. So that's another one. Then, you know, the more we talk to um, publishers, they obviously are seeing their traffic shift very dramatically over to mobile. So one thing that we've done to hopefully help is when a user does Google Plus sign in, and if they have an Android phone, then we ask, would you like the Android app of this publisher? So if a publisher, if we, if we stitch this together, if a publisher lets a user say, hey, friend, I want you to watch this video, when the user takes that action for the first time, it will say, in order to send this, connect you know, your presence here with Google. 
when the user is making that connection, it'll ask, would you like the mobile app? And we hear from publishers that their engagement on mobile apps is orders of magnitude higher than their engagement on the mobile web. And so we're trying to help the publishers get more distribution of their mobile apps for more engagement, right? So they can have a really great feature for users like, hey, involve your friends, get them to comment, get them to you know, watch, get them to read. That simultaneously drives them more app distribution. That simultaneously gets them more traffic back from uh, people's friends on Google. The last one, which I think Sandy probably wants to talk about, is what we just launched around mobile content recommendations, which is great for publishers on mobile web. Right. There's, there's that where you create a much more engaging experience where you try to have the user come back to the, the content of the publisher to say, oh, look, I didn't know. Let me pull this little breadcrumb trail and find what's actually more interesting on your site. The meta point from what Seth was saying before is that we actually had this sort of con concept at Mebo where Publishers these days don't really understand the individual human face to a user. Your IP address, your gender, your age, your location. How do you connect that real life aspect? And so with Google, what you can do is that once you create these communities, you actually have faces to your most you know, avid fans. Like a New York Times or a, or a small newspaper may not know that this person visits their site every day and they are spreading content all over the place. How do I create that connection so that I, as a publisher, and taking advantage of that user and creating a circle around them so they can spread my content around the web. So that kind of evangelism is really hard to do when you don't have that, those tool sets and we're hoping that a lot of our publisher offerings, you know, recommendations, circles, plus pages will then help create that ecosystem to make it a lot more engaging. Yeah. Actually riffing off that, um, so Sandy just pointed out that publishers often don't really know who the person is behind the IP address. Uh, something that Hugo announced in his um, talk on Android yesterday was what we're calling cross-device single sign-on. And this is huge, huge for publishers. So if a user does connect on web or on mobile, they can start on either side. The publisher finds out who that person is. They get their name, they get their profile picture, their public profile data, and their list of friends. Now there's a problem that we have in our, in our industry today, that is we have this device proliferation thing going on. And so you might actually have a user who's logged in on you know, the mobile device, but you have no idea who they are when they go to the web. And that's a problem for delivering them a more relevant experience, right? Because you don't know who they are in one place, you do on another, and it's a monetization problem, right? Because you can't help figure out what this person's interested in from a monetization perspective across devices. With single sign-on, if the user connects on one device, they are now connected on every device because they've created a relationship between them and your service, not them, your service, and a device. So that's another very powerful tool that Hugo just announced yesterday that publishers can take advantage of to create a much more relevant experience for their users. The last one I'll just mention really quickly, because I'm sorry, you asked the, we've, built a lot here, um, hoping that we can really help both developers and publishers. Um, we heard from publishers that in mobile web, their bounce rate was unbelievably high. They have tons of traffic coming in from social streams, but people stay for like 10 seconds, they read an article and they vanish, right? And I'll bet if you all think about your use of kind of mobile web and social streams, you're going through, you're seeing an article, you click, read for 10 seconds, you're gone, right? And what we've done on Monday, was we announced mobile content recommendations. Uh, we had partners come in from Turkey. They heard about mobile content recommendations before they got on the airplane. They landed in SFO, and they had a little bit of time before the car was coming to pick them up, and they implemented mobile content recommendations, literally while they were sitting in SFO. It is that easy to do, and that is designed to engage a user in your site, in your property, when they come visit you, and drive you then more page views. All right, I think, I can't quite see the timer, but I think we're down to around five minutes before, uh, five minutes, okay. So I wanna get to as many as you can, of, of you as we can. We'll try, to, we'll try to do some short answers in the interest of breadth, but uh, back microphone, please. My name is uh, Morten Myrsta, I'm coming uh, from Norway. I'm a com communication consultant. Uh, uh, the last one or two years I've had a stay tuned list on features uh, at the platform. It's about uh, the API, API, it's about the analytics, and it's about the uh, uh, vanity URL. And I'm just wondering, 
the development that you have with design-in functions and, and, and uh, different functions like that, which I love, is that uh, a conclusion that you won't make a regular read-write API? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is, when will we see a Google Analytics for Google Plus, not for the sign-in functions, not for the, uh, for the interaction with websites, but for the engagement on the destination, the social destination as is? And the third question is a regular guy question. When are you guys going to give people a uh, vanity URL? I'm sorry, what was the last Vanity one? URL. Vanity URL. Uh, so I'm going to take this really fast. We have n nothing to announce on personal vanity URLs right now. Um, for Read Write API, like David said, we, would we are getting closer, right? What we've done with Google Plus sign in is getting a lot closer to publishers being able to write stuff into Google. We'll obviously keep pushing the envelope, but we, have n we do not have a Read Write API that's a straight write to stream right now. Like David said, it's because we want to keep qu content quality really high. We will keep working on it. Um, the last question. Analytics. Google analytics. Google. So definitely a request that we've heard loud and clear from the market. There is some early social analytics, both in Google Analytics and as part of the Google Plus sign-in uh, release that you can get from your Plus page, um, but request noted. Next question. Yeah, front microphone. Please. I'm just trying to go quick so you can get try as and many. Try make this as fast as I can for the sake of time. Uh, one word question, XMPP, and then <laughs> and then the second question is regarding extending uh, the, met the schema for individual users for applications where you use Google Plus sign-in. Are you looking at being able to, say, use Knowledge Graph to allow people to add schema to people's identity for their applications? So XMPP has two, uh, two modes, server-to-server -server and client-to-server. Which one are you particularly interested in? Uh, client-to-server. So uh, for client and server, this is to allow um, additional apps to connect in, uh, like a Pigeon or an ADM. Um, what we found is that uh, the client protocol has been pretty limiting in terms of what we want to do and the model for Hangouts. So we have interop um, through to the talk XMPP network, and those apps uh, will continue to work. But since it, the protocol isn't as rich to do all of what we want, that will be limited to one-to-one -one text messages. So you can continue to do that, um, uh, and we'll continue to evaluate from there. Uh, as far as integration with users from other presence environments like Jabber, things like that, are you still going to be able to do that or no? So that's a server-to-server server, server server federation. And um, we have not seen a really strong update. There have been a few uh, folks. Actually, the, one of the biggest, most frequent users, uh, uh, clients of that server-to-server server are actually abusers and spammers who throw up a, a bogus network and then try to attack our, our users. So, um, so far, the uptake has not been compelling for us to really push that forward. Um, we continue to evaluate it, but at this point, um, we've seen more attacks on our users than benefit in, in reality. And on the schema question, catch me afterwards. I, I, I need to drill deeper and we don't have time. We, Okay, um, we, have, we have one minute left. We're not gonna get to all of you, but we're not running away, so we, we will just walk out into the hallway right outside that back door for, for, for other questions. Um, yeah, we have less than a minute. So thank, thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate the, the, the questions and suggestions. I've got a list of things that we'll be uh, bringing back to the team. Also, if you're interested, uh, we have a full day of sessions. Uh, if you're interested in learning about Android and Google Plus sign-in or iOS or web, all of those sessions are today. Uh, there's a partner panel uh, later today in which you can witness like what it what it takes to make a really compelling integration. Um, there's uh, a few other talks that I can't remember. Oh, cross off, which is the talk that was uh, mentioned yesterday, and then best practices, um, how to do uh, best practices on the platform. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.